And I'm so excited to introduce Andrew Bryant. Who knows Andrew? Can you ask him out? Andrew is going to be our esteemed host for tonight, and I'm going to pass it over to you right now. Here's open. All right, thank you for that. Um, I hope everyone's doing great so far. So tonight we have an amazing opportunity to learn from some healthcare professionals that have lots of experience just helping others deal with their mental health. So I'd like to just welcome these three panelists, Dr. Jean Marcou, Linda Castor, and Coralie Pringle Nelson. I want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time and for just the knowledge you're about to share with us. It means a lot. So at the end of our discussion, we will be opening up the panel to questions from the audience. So near the end of our discussion, there will be a phone number behind me on the screen. And feel free to just send any question you have regarding mental health. So before we get started, I would just like each of our panelists to just explain a little bit about themselves and the expertise they have of helping others through their mental health. Yes, there we go. Uh, good evening, I'm Linda Kasdorf. I'm a social worker, I have a master's of social work. I began helping people with their mental health when I was about five years old. I was one of those kids in the neighborhood who heard other people's stories. Most recently in my life, um, I got a master's of social work dealing with uh, children and adolescents accessing pornography and the impact on their lives. And uh, I work in private practice, and part of that is a contract with the Saskatoon Christian School, K-12. And I work with little people right up to older adults. It's a fun adventure. Hi there, I'm Coralie Pringle Nelson. I'm a registered psychologist. Um, I'm currently on a year's leave from my position. I am doing some more graduate training looking at trauma response and leadership. So, a lot of my work is in the area of trauma. Um, so, some of the tragedies that have occurred in Saskatchewan have been part of my area of purview and involvement. Um, but I got started actually looking or being involved in the area of forensic psychology and still do a little bit of work in, in that area, but mostly now uh, private practice contract work and uh, working on, on some more graduate work. Good evening, thanks for having me over. I came through the door expecting a 50 plus crowd and it was just delightful to see all the under 25s in the room. I appreciate that. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to, to kids. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's what keeps us all young, so thanks for, thanks for having us over. I've, I've, um, I've been a physician for 34 years, and I've been a psychiatrist for about 27 years now. I work uh, with the uh, Sassoon uh, Health Authority, and I, I actually emphasize severe and persistent mental illness. And I really want to show you tonight that the Bible is full of mental illness and mental illness issues. We can actually make some very interesting diagnoses, which I will do with you later, so just stay tuned. Awesome, thanks for that. So I have a few questions, and just feel free to jump in with an answer um, whenever you feel like it. So the first question, what's one of the major myths you would like to debunk as professionals when it comes to Christians struggling with mental health? Okay, the mic got passed me first, but somebody else is going to get it first on the next question. Uh, you know, a myth I want to debunk is that weak people um, suffer from mental illness. That is simply not true. And the uh, piece that connects to that is that people with weak faith suffer with mental illness or are not cured of it. Um, for me, and I'm just wondering, I have a, a little bit of a, just a slide that I had actually asked to have put up, just for some, some discussion. Um, and, and one of the things that I think for us, and I'll talk more about this slide, uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher um, from Dalhousie University, is uh, from a biblical perspective that, as Linda said, you know, people are weak, or that if you pray hard enough, if you do some kind of religious or spiritual activity, uh, you should be able to manage all of the symptoms or concerns that you have. And in fact, I, I don't think that's, that's entirely true. I'll talk more about that, but I think the other thing that fits in here is mental health is not a binary concept, you either have it or you don't. Uh, there are various aspects to it, uh, all the way to very serious conditions that I think uh, Dr. Marku will do an excellent job sharing about. 
I think there's there's five things that uh, that Christians in my practice. And by the way, I see two pastors from this church in my practice. Okay, so just FYI, there are five things that well-meaning, poorly informed Christians lay on each other. It goes like this: There's sin in your life. You don't have enough faith. You don't pray enough. You don't read the scriptures enough, or there's a demon in your life. Those are the big five that we tend to lay on each other. Now, the second thing I want to say is that, unfortunately, the evangelical world has a very poor, listen up, theology of suffering. Okay, So when it comes to the, the theology of suffering, the Catholics do a much better job than the evangelicals. And I think that, that one of the struggles that we, when we went to the Reformation, we threw a lot of that stuff out. Some of the mainline Protestants have much better theological understanding. But all you have to do is Google prosperity gospel, and you just eliminate the whole suffering gospel. So those are some concerns. Thank you. So our second question is, how does our mental health affect our overall health? Well, if we look at mental health from, as, as I mentioned before, kind of the four possible levels, even stress can have a huge impact on like our immune system, for example. And so if you're students right now, I am too, so I empathize, um, you are going to peak at about December 5th, 6th, 7th, or 8th, whenever your exams are done, and then what happens to you? You get sick. You get sick. Now that's just a kind of conventional example, but the truth is our mental health and our physical health are really interrelated. And so finding ways to um, manage symptoms or increase calm in one's life has a huge effect on, on better mental health and, um, and physical health. That was a good answer, I guess. <laughs> okay, so how can people educate themselves to improve their mental health? Um, we all have a vast um, expanse of knowledge right in our pockets, and on our telephones. And uh, I would say to you, the Canadian Mental Health Association has a terrific website. So if you're interested in understanding about mental health and you want to educate yourself, it's a quick Google. Um, and then to improve your mental health, I would say to you, um, be realistic about what's going on in your life. Seek appropriate help. Um, we're going to talk a little later about that, I think. But to improve your mental health, you really need to begin to address what are the issues that are going on and to get appropriate diagnosis and uh, then support. All right. So... How can we help others that may be struggling with their own mental health? Probably anybody, any of us can sort of grab on these. I, one of the things that I always tell patients and their families is that patients whose families hang on to them during times of suffering. So people who are suffering when their friends stay with them, that is probably the single most important thing. Patients of mine who have been abandoned by friends and family, and typically it's because they're just too difficult to hang on to. I mean, there's some of the, if you want to see some really wild behaviors, it's going to be in some of these severely mentally ill people, that they will always do worse when people abandon them. So I think the very first thing to do is to, is to not abandon people. That, I think, is the core thing. And the second thing is, is don't, don't try and explain to them what they're suffering. I mean, that just doesn't work. Don't, don't pull out the big five that I listed for you uh, earlier. Far better to just sit and listen and, and ask how I can help. I think it's important to... Now, the thing is, it, it actually can be a very heavy burden. If you're the only friend, and friends abandon the mentally ill pretty quickly, if you're, if you're the only friend that's standing by, you're going to get burned out pretty quickly. So, so it really, really is, is important. A group like this, if, now I just want to give you some information. How many here know uh, of anybody who is suicide? Does anybody know, is anybody related to anybody, or is anybody having a good friend suicide? Suicide, okay. Does anybody in the, in the room know who, uh, know somebody who's, who's had a major depression? Okay, look, look around. Now what about this one? 
who will admit that in their family they have maybe either major anxiety problems or a substance abuse problem? Okay. So you see how you see how common this stuff is. So we don't walk away, we hang in there with them, we don't try and explain, we don't try and tell them what to do, we we hang on and we just endure. That's I think one of the best ways to to just make yourself known. Some literature, um, the psychotherapy literature, looks at this concept of attunement. And attunement really means to feel felt. And uh, sometimes all people need when they're suffering uh, severe concerns, whether it be you know, a situational concern or something more, is to feel felt. That doesn't mean you have to have all the answers, that doesn't mean you have to solve the problem, and it doesn't even mean that you have to try to put yourself in their shoes, because that actually can cause some difficulty for you. Just be there, fully present, and let them feel felt, and that has some real power for engagement and, and helping to lift the spirits of those who are really suffering. And I guess I would add to these two awesome answers, educate yourself about what it is they're going through. If they actually have have a diagnosis, find out what that means. Um, come alongside them and also, I'm sitting talking to you with an open hand here, tell them there's no judgment. So um, if that goes along with Jean's top five, but I think it's really important that um, we don't judge what another person is going through and to come alongside them and, and be an ally. And so um, that means sometimes uh, acknowledging behavior that's really uncomfortable uh, to be engaged in, to uh, find ways to support yourself. So when you come along and support someone with, with a mental health disorder, um, we want to also be supporting ourselves because if we don't do that, as Jean said, we're going to experience burnout, and then we'll have two people that are needing support in a serious manner. Okay. So how can people become aware of their own mental illness, and what are some of the initial steps in understanding or handling our mental illness? Well, again, if, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slide, just, just to put some clarity, um, a mental health concern is not necessarily a mental illness. So the, the reason that this peaks at the top in a pyramid is not that it actually describes incident rates, but people who are down, low, have a blue mood, don't necessarily fit in that top category of an illness. So one of the things that Dr. Stan Kucher does is he really talks about how are we using the language of mental health. <clears throat> in some of the positions I have gone into, um, I walk in the door and people say, everyone has mental health. And my comment is, well, that's great. Mental health is a good thing. What they mean is everyone's nuts, right? And fix it. Well, that's not my job. One of the things that I found really helpful is to give people language. What is a problem? What is mental distress? What is a mental health problem that can kind of vacillate between the mental illness or something that is quite concerning getting in the way of your life, and then something that is diagnosis worthy, something that may require medication, may require medication and intensive psychotherapy. So finding some language to even talk to people really helps us understand this concept of mental illness, that we don't, want to, we don't want to brush everyone with the same stroke. We want to ensure that there are gradients, um, and that actually helps with hope. For people to say, oh, I'm in mental distress. I haven't lost my mind. Now, of course, untreated, that could become more serious, but some of the work of Stan Kutcher is really to say, you know what, we got we to start talking about this using realistic language, but everything that happens to us that is distressing, it's not necessarily a mental illness or something that requires a diagnosis. One of the things that I do is I, I, medicate, I medicate mental illness. So, so as a physician, we, like, there's a number of specialties, and, and um, the psychiatrists are the ones that do the medication of, of, uh, of 
mental illness or mental distress to the point where it becomes illness. Now, let, me, let me just clarify a few things. First of all, it's people that have anxiety that think they're going crazy. Okay? And it's because of the intense pain that anxiety causes. People who really are, excuse the language, crazy are people who don't think they are. Okay, so psychosis by definition is, is where our reality testing actually is way outside of reality. And it's those people who don't believe that they have a problem that are, are the, really the severe cases. Like when you're talking about things like schizophrenia and maybe a severe bipolar condition with, with psychosis. So, so I, I also want to say that just because patients have symptoms, it doesn't mean that they need to have medication. When we start medicating, here's the cut. We start medicating mental illness when a person's function starts to fall. So there's a lot of people that can deal with a lot of the distress that uh, Corley was talking about, but it's when their function starts to be impaired. They can't manage relationships. They can't keep going to school anymore. They can't get up in the morning. They can't. They can't look after themselves. They're losing 30 pounds. They become suicidal. So, so when a person's function starts to fail. That's when we step in with medications. Just because you have the symptoms of mental illness, if you're coping, even if it's barely, if you're coping and you're still covering the bases, we don't recommend medications for those cases. It's when your function really starts to be impaired. Okay, so that's important to understand. So what would you guys say is the, the biggest, or maybe just big barriers that most people face when addressing issues around their mental health. I know probably language was one of them, but what else could you add to that? I think that um, a very major issue for people in addressing their own mental health or choosing to get um, help for it is one's own pride. And we talk about stigma attached to mental health, and often um, the person who's experiencing a mental health concern has had some type of judgment that they have made about mental health. And um, maybe they've been educated in their home that um, our family's strong, we don't have those kinds of problems, or these problems, if we have them, are kept inside the family. So pride is a really um, big component of stepping out. And then the other one, I think, is courage, actually facing the distress um, and, and being willing to step out and tell your story and um, access some help. So we discussed some of the myths earlier around uh, the Christians have around mental health. So in response to those myths, like just pray it away, you're not reading enough scripture, how can our beliefs about scripture and the nature of God influence our mental health? Okay, so there's some really good news. Um, and the good news is this, that we've actually done a fair amount of research when it comes to the benefits of faith, when it comes to mental illness. Okay, so here they are. People of faith do better with the same mental illness, the same diagnosis, than people who don't have faith. For instance, uh, the hospitalization rates of people of faith are lower than pay, uh, people that don't have faith processes. The amount of substance abuse in populations that don't have faith is much higher than, than people of faith. People of faith have the same incidence of major depression, but their use of medications is less. Okay? Other things, um, incidence of personality disorders, some of the, some of the most profoundly uh, distressing problems with mental health are personality disorders. I, I, won't, I won't go into the details of that, but the point is, is that the incidence of those, those problems in the church, people of faith, are actually less. So we know that there's, there's profound benefits when it comes to faith. The other thing is, it's better to have faith before the mental illness starts than, than to develop it after. But, I mean, hey, we'll take it whatever we can get it. We know that if people are able to embrace faith after the onset of mental illness, they do better. So, so first of all, there's nothing actually when it comes to the, to the treatment of mental illness that is actually better than anything else. We know that things like being in a relationship, being married actually, is protective when it comes to mental illness. You do better. You do better if you have a faith community. You do better if you take the medications. Here's one that's interesting. Patients who have faith 
take your medications more regularly than people who don't. They've already settled who who the boss is. It's not them. And I think if you're running your own life, you tend not to be very compliant with medication. So, so, so be aware that faith actually has all kinds of benefits, protective benefits when it comes to mental illness. So that's 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 really important. The other thing is is to know that that the, the best news on the on, on, on the evening is that I am going to be fully unemployed in heaven, and that I'm looking forward to that. So, so we have we have some serious challenges to get through down here. I'm going to, I'm going to toss out the scripture. What does this mean? Hebrews two ten. Jesus was perfected by suffering. I thought he was perfect, first of all. And, and what does suffering, see, so here's the theology of suffering that we don't get. Um, it took me 35 years before I actually heard anything about mental illness from the pulpit in the church. So we tend not to talk about it in the church. But we know that suffering is a big part of the Christian life. Jesus was perfected by, notice, he wasn't perfected by pleasure. He wasn't perfected by by power, he wasn't perfected by pain, by fame. He was perfected by suffering. So I think that's something else to realize is that that suffering actually does some really good things to us. And so there's something about that that's very powerful. So those are just some those are just some, some things to think about. All right. So I just want to let the audience know we have just a couple more questions, but the number will be on the screen behind me. And if you have any questions related to mental health or mental illnesses, feel free to just text that number and we will get to it at the end of this, uh, this portion of the service. Andrew, can I just add, add to that last answer? Yeah, for sure. So uh, that last question included a piece that said, uh, how can our beliefs about scripture and the nature of God influence our mental health? And I think that when we have an understanding of God as loving, gracious, compassionate, um, meeting us in our place of deepest need. Uh, we, as healer, we can sit and be with him. Uh, in my own life, I experienced a depression about three years ago following a brain injury. And one of the things that really helped me, as Jean said, our faith is a protective factor. For me, it was that that was a constant the, my faith was the constant source of my healing as I rested in a depressed state. And um, so knowing um, that the Lord is there for me, that he cares about me, that he has compassion on my place of suffering, those were very profound um, and impactful experiences in my life. And then using scripture to um, literally speak over myself, that was like this healing balm that happened over and over again. Um, many, many, many hundreds of times a day as I journeyed out of that space into a place again of being well. So I'm an example of a believer who went through a very dark time and has come out on the other side, and I just give God the glory for that. And I believe that he is the one who, you know, did that healing work in me, and part of that was just simply the word of God spoken over and over in my life. So. Thank you. So would you guys say that, I know... In the earlier and tonight, we said that just being there to support our friends that are going through mental illness or mental health. Would you say that God, having God, he, he's our constant support, and that's one of the reasons why people are able to deal with mental health issues better because we constantly have that support from God. Yeah, I think that that's a, the, a really key aspect. Um, from a spiritual perspective, if I'm seeing clients who have faith, I have a whole extra toolkit that I can bring into into the into the room. If I'm in a clinic setting, um, I don't tend to have that opportunity. But in my private practice, a whole other toolkit. And, and one of the things, not not if people are hitting in that little red part at the top. Um, that's where we would determine that somebody is, their functioning is really compromised, they can't do what they need to do uh, to, to get the things done in their lives that are required. But in some of the other levels, one of the things that I really focus on with people is aligning their beliefs with scripture. And one of the things that happens when somebody is really stressed out is that they find it very, very difficult to believe the truth of scripture. And so there's these little voices that come up and say, no, that's not true, that's not true, or it's not true for me, it might be true for everyone else. 
And <clears throat> a lot of the work that I do is really working with, with the body and helping the nervous system to re-regulate across time. And when that happens, beliefs, the truth of scripture can really start to take root. So those concepts that, that Linda described, who God is. If God is good, he has good for me. Doesn't mean there isn't suffering. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Um, but at the same time, aligning beliefs with scripture, <clears throat> settling into that truth, as Linda said, bathing oneself in scripture. And, and this is not to be religious or to please God. Because that goes back to what Dr. Marcoux was saying about these things that we lay on ourselves and other people. This is about resting in who we are, finished work of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And so for me, uh, alignment of, of my practice and also my spiritual beliefs really come to the fore when I have someone who, who shares my beliefs in Jesus as, as my Savior. So kind of on that note, what uh, what verses, scriptures, books of the Bible that um, can really? Oh, I'm glad I'm glad you asked. Okay, let's have some fun. How many suicides in the Bible? Three, two, three, two. Okay, who? Okay, what's the most famous suicide of all time? Judas. Judas. Sure. And how did he die? Hanging. Okay, I want you to note a couple things. Okay, just just keep noting how these people died and who they were. Okay, so who was the second one? Saul. Okay, so Saul died by throwing on himself on his sword, right? Okay, keep going. Who was watching Saul when he threw himself on his sword? His his armor bearer. And then what did he do? He threw himself on his sword too. So that was actually the first, as far as I'm aware, the first recorded copycat suicide in history. Once again, it was a youngster, it was a young male, who killed himself when he saw his boss go down, right? So, so that wasn't necessarily a compact. So that was three. There's three more. Why don't you keep on going? Remember there was a guy named Samson? How did he take himself out? Kind of an act of war, but he pushed, he pushed the temple over and killed three or 4,000 Philistines. So, so that's kind of an interesting suicide. There's two more. Do you remember who Ahithophel was? Of course you'll remember who Ahithophel was. Yeah. He was. He was David's favorite advisor who went over to Absalom. And then do you remember he counseled Absalom to quickly attack David, take him on the fort before he was even ready. And then I think it was uh, Bruse who said he was told to go back by David to, to, uh, to thwart the wise counsel of Ahithophel. Anyways... Hithophel, when he saw that his good counsel wasn't taken, he went home, put himself his house in order, and he hung himself. Now here's something that you probably didn't know that's kind of a cool little thing. Do you remember Second Chronicles? Do you remember the books that everybody avoids? Second Chronicles tells us that Ahithophel, get this, was the grandfather of Bathsheba. That's kind of interesting. A little bit of, a little bit of palace intrigue. And, and he had this really cool... A uh, son called Eliam, who was who was buddies. He was one of the mighty men along with Uriah the Hittite. So, so this guy gave his young mighty man his daughter in marriage, and then David messed the whole thing up, and the grandfather was upset. Anyway, that was now the last one nobody will ever get. It's called Zimri. Do you remember in the in the Northern Kingdom when they were going through a king every two or three months? Zimri was a guy who ended up burning himself down in the citadel as he was being attacked. So we have we have six males, we have very lethal methods, we have hanging, I suppose a sword would qualify as a gun in the 21st century. And then we have then we have immolation. So so that kind of lines up with the modern understanding of, of uh, suicide. Now I just gotta do the second one because it just has a really fun caveat to it. Who, who do you, or where do you think you'll find the craziest Scripture in the Bible where people really are, or somebody's really over the top. Anybody want to toss it out? Pardon me? I know not, but yes, I know an individual. Does anybody remember King Nebuchadnezzar? What happened to that guy? <coughs> yeah, let me read it to you. Okay. Do you remember he was strutting about on, his, on the palace wall and then there was a voice from heaven saying that you're going to be tossed down? Immediately what had been said, this is in Daniel, 
was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass. Get this. He ate grass like a like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Now, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him with this river. It was for seven years. Now, I've got a story for you. When I, was, when I was younger and I'm doing a lot of call, fortunately I'm off the call schedule now, but I was doing a lot of call and I'd been up most of the night. And early in the morning, a guy came in and I was supposed to see him. He was a little disheveled and a little bit off when I saw him. This would have been about 5.30 in the morning. But this guy had green foam on his mouth. And I commented, you got green foam in your mouth, man. What's, what's going on? And what he did was he had, he, I have a lot of people who overdose on gravel. Okay, so... If, if you take enough gravel, you'll have what we call an anticholinergic delirium. Now, if you want to, if you want to have a very bizarre experience and feel like you've been kicked like a mule the next day, go and do what this guy did. Anyways, get this: he thought he was a cow, and he was out eating grass. Yeah. So, so that was just the Lord making sure that I was on call so that he could just toss that my way because I, I knew about Nebuchadnezzar, right? So, so. The Bible has a lot of really cool stuff in it that actually pertains to mental illness. Lord Byron said that the book of Job was the finest, one of the finest pieces of literature in the Western, in the Western literature. The book of Job tackles suffering like no other piece of literature on the planet. Okay, so planet, uh, so suffering and mental illness are really tackled, major depression really tackled well in the book of Job. Okay. So what is the most beneficial way to incorporate our Christian faith into our discussion with mental health? <laughs> oh, Linda gets it. Um, it's an interesting question. I'm, I'm going to take it and uh, do what Someone, someone once told me about university classes. If you get a question you don't exactly know what to do with, just recreate it and answer that question. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to presume about this question is, um, into our discussion about mental health, I'm, I'm wondering if this is actually a conversation. So how would I, inter how would I involve the Christian faith in a conversation with someone about their mental health? One of the things... I might do is ask them, um, so I'm with someone, I, I'm thinking about this less as a professional and, and more as a friend. So if I was sitting as a friend with someone and they were talking with me about their distress, um, I might ask them, especially if they're a newer friend to me and I don't know their story, tell me your story. Tell me about your life. I mean, then I would ask, tell me, do you have a relationship with God? Is that part of what's you know, where do you get your support from? An invitation into conversation. Um, and then I might share something, if I'm invited, about what I know about how God has met me and or someone else in a time of distress um, that, that might be similar to theirs. Um, and then I might give them a scripture, um, ask if I might give them a scripture that would be encouraging or hopeful to them, something that they could hold on to, something that they might want to, you know, tuck into their wallet or their bag or their pocket. Um, um, actually, I knew a group of women that uh, for a long season journeyed together by tucking a word of scripture into their bra every day. And um, they shared those same scriptures, and it was a, a way of encouraging them on a journey that was very, very difficult and distressing. And um, so I think that's some ways I would use the faith and scripture to encourage others. Um, most definitely, I feel it's very important that uh, that we're inviting, that we have a, an open, inviting conversation rather than a, you know, if you have faith. I heard at, a, at Young Adults last week that uh, people with faith do better with their mental health concerns. So, like, let's get, let's get you on your knees here. <laughs> Much better to be inviting and to ask what people already know and, and to encourage them. I think the other thing is just, you know, what is it that you think you need? And, and sometimes um, believers, the, the thing that they don't need right at that moment 
is more God talk. And that's tricky. That's tricky. Um, but being really sensitive and giving them space. Sometimes in, in sessions or with um, you know people in my life, just space. Just allowing them to sit there and, and come up with what is it that they need. Like we all have great answers. I mean, we might have a few answers ourselves, but the truth is, if the Holy Spirit is working in the individual and if that person is a believer, just giving them space, being near them, helping them feel supported and encouraged, but also giving them the opportunity to determine what it is that they might need. And, and then being there to possibly help facilitate that. Again, you don't have to solve other people's problems. That, that, that doesn't have to be your role as a friend. But there are supports in our community. There are therapists, psychiatrists, um, various public service agencies that support individuals. And so even sometimes helping them find that person can be an act of goodwill one believer to another, and can actually help that individual as they make the turn that they need to in their lives. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for your time so far. We are going to now open it up to the questions you guys have texted in. So our first question is, is it normal or okay to have suicidal thoughts? Well, I, I've actually had a number of suicides in my in my practice, and it's, it's actually I'm, I, I teach on the subject to the medical school and the residents, and so so suicide has been a, a study of mine for a long time. I I don't think first of all it, we don't actually use the word normal in in, uh, in in medicine. We actually use the word average because normal is such a wide range, and it's it's um, it's difficult to assess. I don't think it's average for the average person to think of suicide. However, it is common for a lot of people, and, and this is typically what it is. Nobody wants to experience the big one. Nobody here wants to die tonight so they can see what's on the other side and prove it once and for all. But, but what happens is that the level of suffering just gets so, so high that you need relief. And that's when you start thinking about offing yourself. And, and suicide goes through very passive ideas. You know, life sucks, full stop. Life sucks, I really should do something about it, full stop. Life sucks, I think I'm going to do something about it. Still passive. And then it's when you get into the active stuff where you're sort of dancing with the idea and you're planning something. And then you start to, to sort of tell you do it. It's when you stand on the chair and you put a rope around the rafter and then you put a rope around your neck and you have to lean and test it. So, so these are all things that people start doing. So, so these things wouldn't be considered average and they're not considered healthy, but the point is they're really, really common. So I think it's really important. I, I never get excited when people come and start talking about suicidal ideation. I, I just put the topic on the table and I talk about the level of suffering they have. So this is really about the capacity to cope. Have you people heard of IQ? Well, what's what's IQ? Yeah. Intelligence quotient. Intelligence quotient. I think, in, in, to make it really uh, uh, sort of quick and easy, that's actually a mathematical speed. Your speed of, of thinking, and it really pertains to your capacity to manage abstract thinking. That's what IQ is. What about EQ? That may be a little less common. What, what does EQ stand for? Emotional and emotional quotient, right? And that's the capacity to manage the emotions of others. Now I've invented something, it's called SQ, and it's suffering quotient. What exactly can you stand in terms of suffering? And I, and I think that, that, that really that's what we assess with people, you know, and so suicidal ideas are just ways that you're communicating, the way that you're picking up, that you're really starting to max out on your capacity to manage the pain in your life. And so when you start thinking about suicidal ideation, you do not hide, you start telling people. And we don't get scared, you know, if somebody tells me that they're suicidal, it's not like let's drop, let's drop everything and call the ambulance and drive them into a emergency. Like let's, that's not what we do, right? It, we, we sit and talk about suffering and we decompress them from that point of view. 
You know that you need to get somebody into the emergency when they're having suicidal, uh, suicidal ideas, when they're actively planning and they can no longer keep themselves safe. Here's your, here's your acid question to your buddy. Can you keep yourself safe? And if they say no, that's the time that you got to start thinking about getting somebody else other than yourself. But if I've got lots of patients that I ask them, they say, oh, I'm, I'm safe, I'm just having difficult, uh, difficult ideas. The other thing is, um, I do a lot of training in the area of suicide as well, um, and have traveled the province uh, doing that. One of the things that, that we know, it's back to language. Um, as soon as the word suicide is stated as it's been stated here, it really helps to put what is out there. Is it a suicidal thought, or is it something else? But being able to talk about it as what it is, rather than, uh, you're not going to hurt yourself, are you? No, no, no. People who are going to hurt themselves um, are doing it for a different reason often, the field of non-suicidal self-injury. Um, people who want to die don't want to be hurt. So calling it what it is, allowing it to be what it is, is really helpful in a conversation and can help keep your friends safe, help keep you safe. Our next question is, how can I help others be less dismissive of mental illness in regards to their faith? Now this example is, there's a person in my family who is dealing with mental illness, and how can I kind of stick up for them while still being respectful of my parents who seem to be just dismissing them? Um, well, I would suggest if you are the person whose parents are being dismissive, that you find an opportunity to have calm conversation with your parents when the person who is having uh, the mental health concern is not present, and to talk with them about how their dismissiveness first impacts you, so how you experience it, and why you see the mental health concern to be um, concerning, valid, and um, then to model walking alongside the family member who has a, has a mental health concern. And even if your parents do not um, ever come on board, um, you have this incredible opportunity to, um, to be a loving family member. Often, when parents don't come on board, it's because they are afraid. And maybe they believe something like this myth, if I'd been a better parent, my child wouldn't have a mental health concern. And that is a very common myth that either parents themselves have put on themselves or somebody else. Um, I don't know how it could be well-meaning, but maybe, you know, have, they've heard it somewhere. And so uh, that can stop parents. So to invite them in to face reality and to partner in the journey of helping the family member to get help and to become well. And sometimes in the family, there might be an auntie or someone else who can be an ally. And, and there has to be real carefulness around this, real wisdom in, in potentially inviting another adult into the conversation. So it's not throwing it up on Facebook or Instagram. It's, it's really being wise and saying, who might be someone that my parents trust Know that that you know this person's thinking with all cylinders, and and engage that person in a conversation so you don't feel alone in that. And so there's ways to to do that um, that that are respectful and supportive, take into consideration a measure of confidentiality, but also don't keep you feeling really isolated and alone in in carrying that. This next question is directed towards Dr. Marku, and they're asking if you could just expand on the term theology of suffering. If you could give a definition and then give an example of good theology that can be found in the Catholic Church, like you were saying, and then an example of bad theology that we have. Somebody's really raking me over that said, I'm, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a theologian, that's the first, uh, I guess my, that's the first caveat I want to put out there. 
I think, I think theology, uh, by its nature, is the so-called study of God. And I think that, that a correct theology of suffering needs to start from a correct understanding of God and what God's use of suffering is in the world. And, and I think the fact that it's, it's very important to know that, I mean, right, right from the Garden of Eden onwards, suffering came in with sin, so the connection of sin and suffering. But, but there's other things, like what, there's also vicarious suffering. Christ actually didn't deserve the suffering that, that he endured for us. And so there's also something about that. Like, for instance, um, we know that the, most, the single most important, this is a very bad joke, the single most important thing to avoid mental illness is to choose your parents wisely. <laughs> and, the, and the thing about that is that this is, this is primarily uh, a, genetic, uh, a genetic tendency. So we know that, for instance, when, when there's, uh, when there's uh, schizophrenia in the family, there's a 50% chance that somebody else, the first of your relative, is going to have the same illness. We know that ADHD is the most terrible of all disorders. Uh, whenever, whenever parents come in with a, with a child with ADHD, you know, uh, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we know that there's something like a 60% chance that one of the parents have it. So, so we know that, that, that mental illness and its suffering is somehow genetically related. So, so the people that have it are, are somehow vicariously bequeathed this from generations. Now, how does this stuff happen? I mean, does, does mental illness or sin somehow insinuate itself into the, to the human genome? You know, so there's, there's all kinds of I, sort of like notions uh, about that. But back to the theology of suffering. So I think, I think the notion that suffering is a very uh, big part of life, but that it actually could be a significant part of life and actually used by God to improve us. And he clearly does it. Doesn't Paul say... You know, uh, I, I complete the sufferings of Christ in my body. So, so what does that mean? So I think a correct theology of suffering, you've got to think about the suffering scripture. How many here have read the book of Job at least two times? Okay, good. So what exactly does that mean? What exactly, what, what does it mean when somebody comes in and curses the day that they were born? May the person who came and pronounced my birth be cast into the outer darkness. What, what, and then what about a book of suffering where Job is spending his whole time imploring God for answers, why, 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 and then God doesn't answer the question. But he says 40 different times in different ways, where were you when? Where were you when, when the mountain goat gives birth? Where were you when I made the icicle in, in deepest darkness. So his response is, is totally unsatisfying. But it is satisfying in a different way if we get beyond the notion that we've got to understand why. So I think this whole notion of why in mental illness, so wrestling with that. And then looking at, looking at evangelicalism, I, I think that the prosperity gospel is a very seductive and attractive gospel. Who, who doesn't want to have prosperity? Who doesn't want to have health? Now the thing is, those, those notions are actually part of scripture. They are, they're part of it. But when we exclude everything else, we only have half of the book. And I think, I think that is the great problem in evangelical Christianity, is that we, we really have a very impaired uh, understanding of scripture. And the big five that I mentioned are the best that we got. Like, like that's pretty impaired theology as far as I'm concerned. So that's maybe kind of a, a windy answer. But, you know, on the spot, it's the best that I can do. Thank you for that. So this next question is dealing with uh, a person who has had a long time struggling with abandonment. And in her case, she's been kind of brushing it off using humor. And she's wondering how she can actually kind of communicate to herself how she's actually feeling versus just joking about it. So uh, abandonment can be really profound for people. And um, one of the areas that I look at when I talk to people about feelings of being betrayed or abandoned is really the attachment literature. All the way back to what, you know, John Bowlby way back when, when he started looking at how babies attach with their primary caregiver. And what happens when 
there is this proximity. There is the nerve system calming the nervous system. It's when there is this relational interaction that is so incredibly powerful. God made us with this connectability. And one of the things that happens in abandonment are there's these beliefs that come into play. This reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. So we begin to interpret our experience based on whatever comes to our mind. Now, there might be things that, that seem reasonable. Well, it must be this. Well, it must be that. Oh, when this happened. And so there's some reasons and rationales that start to settle in really, 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 really deep. And those things are quite challenging to root out. But they're not impossible. And so when um, someone is dealing with feelings of being abandoned, a place that I invite them to walk into, and it, it's not always um, an easy path, there's a lot of this in therapeutic work. You think you're going this way? No, you're going this way. Um, and so I really invite them into this place of experiencing the love of God. It's a deep place. It's a quiet place. It means the phone is put aside. It means there's rest. And, and there's this process of hearing the voice of God, which is not the voice of worship songs, um, it may be the voice of scripture, but it comes in this place of quiet and of rest. Now, for some people with really quite um, extensive abandonment issues, they can't find the quiet. And that's when my encouragement would be to, to access some additional support, to find your way to find the quiet so you can hear the voice of God, hear the loving, nurturing, attachment focused kinds of words that he wants to speak to you. So, you know, on kind of a, a, a level where, um, you know, it might happen more in young adulthood compared to abandonment that happened early, um, there's some, some real differences in, in how I would respond to that. So if you um, have just had this revelation that um, abandonment is your issue and you've been running from it, you may want to just sit and take that word and put it on a piece of paper in front of you and ask the Lord to speak to you about that word and what that word means to you. You might have to book an appointment with yourself to be courageous to do that. And um, you might even want to tell a couple friends, I've got some important work to do with God, would you pray for me? And sit down and, and write down what comes to you. And that may be a beginning of this you know, journey into being able to sit with yourself, hold space for yourself, and then um, as Corley says, you may need to further that with uh, some support from, um, maybe it will be prayer support, maybe it will be support from a person um, in a counseling office somewhere. Um, but I would just encourage you to sit down and, and do business with yourself. What is it you think about abandonment? Uh, when did that happen? What do you know about it? Um, what do you do when you feel it? Uh, where does it drive you to? Uh, those kinds of things can be very insightful. So this will actually be our last question. Uh, we've had over 50 questions texted in, and we couldn't get to them all. But thank you for just interacting with our panel. It's, uh, it's been great to just be able to hear from you guys. This last question says, or it asks, would you say there is an ideal first option when seeking professional help? For example, visiting a therapist versus a psychiatrist. I think the best way, the best, uh, let me back up, the, the ideal entry way into sorting out mental health issues is your family physician. It's really uh, males, uh, how many males in this room have a family physician that they see? Come on, now fess up. Okay, now how many females have a family physician that they actually see? Oh, it's a little bit better, but that's the issue when you're 20, you're 20, I mean, good heavens. But, but the point is, is that a family physician is actually paid for by the government. You actually have free access to medical care. And if you start to see distress in your life, that's an ideal place to go. And they can start sorting out if it's serious. Uh, you'll never get into specialty care unless you go through your family doctor. Family docs always try and see if they can manage it first, and then they refer on. 
And they, they're pretty decent at knowing whether uh, access needs to go onto the serious end of the stick, which would be the psychiatrist, or if there's things in between, or uh, they don't forget that they can start medications too if function starts to really be impaired. Now we have the we have the public system when it comes to social work and uh, psychology support, both for counseling and for assessments. And so the public purse does pay for that as well. Currently in Saskatoon, there's something called the intake through mental health, and you can actually personally go down to intake and, and get an assessment, and they can sort out what type of problem it is, what's the name of it, and, and move you on to different things. People that have a little bit more financial means have access to the, the private system, and that's that's paid per um, per review. And that uh, so there's a lot of counselors of various stripes and kinds, uh, many excellent ones in the community that you that you pay for to see. But I think a family physician is a is a good way to start. That's a if you have other ideas. Well, you know, if, if you're in, you know, acute distress, this is the other thing sometimes that happens, or one of your friends, we also have a service called Crisis Intervention Services, and they are connected with the Saskatoon Health Authority and some of the other supports. Uh, crisis Intervention Services, if, you know, you have a friend and you are pretty darn sure that they are at risk and you're not getting them to emergency, you can call mobile. And uh, they will they will support you now. A couple of things to know about crisis intervention services. Um, okay, um, so they work. They're they're mostly on. They have more staff evenings, weekends, and holidays. And so they're a service that is just. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I use that service, uh, but they are invaluable. So if there's acute distress. Um, they will assist you. And that number, 933-6200. And as Dr. Mark, who um, was talking about mental health intake, 655-7777, they're kind of at an 8.30 to 4.30, but they provide, and, and weekdays, not weekends. So there are some, some definitely some options within our, our Saskatoon community. I've got one other point as well. Um, a lot of a lot of folks, and, and this has a legitimate this has a legitimate base, would prefer to have a Christian psychiatrist, counselor, social worker, and psychologist. Um, they prefer to have a Christian uh, uh, physician as well. But I I know of uh, people of different faiths who are colleagues of mine who are superb psychiatrists. I, I think that um, when it comes to certain types of mental health provision. There's lots of really good help out there, and you don't have to have faith alignment. It, it is helpful when it comes to certain things. But for instance, would you want a Christian surgeon who has a bit of a tremor versus a really so solid Islamic surgeon who knows exactly what he's doing? So, so I think be careful with that. When it comes to spiritual issues, however, you really want to find somebody who is aligned with your own faith. I mean, I think that I think that that's very important. But when it comes to psychological strategies or biological strategies like medications, you don't need to have somebody of same faith. But but you want to be cautious. We want to be cautious too with some of the Christian counselors out there who also aren't very good. So 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 you have to be you have to be careful. You have to be careful. It's not just a faith card that we're playing. So uh, last comment for me. Um, how do you find out if someone's good? You can call and uh, ask to speak with a counselor. You can um, check around in your circle of friends. Has someone else seen a, a counselor or a therapist? Uh, what do they say about them? You can ask people in the next generation up that you trust. People you can go see your pastor or you know one of the staff at your church and say, "Hey, who are you recommending? Um, this is the kind of thing I, I want to take care of." So um, I very strongly agree that. Um, not all counselors, um, psychologists, psychiatrists are uh, exactly alike, and so to, to get a, a referral is a really good idea. Um, I want to add, and I'm sorry, this isn't part of your question. If tonight you have been triggered by some of the conversation about suicide, and you yourself have struggled with suicidal ideation, um, if you are struggling, do not leave here tonight without talking to someone who could support you. Um, their, the mobile crisis number has been given out. That's a, a great number to call also. Um, as we talk about mental health, one of the things that can happen is that inside of us, a trigger you know, can be hit. Um, some of the stories that have been shared are, are very graphic. And 
Um, so I just want to caution you, don't leave here tonight if you are struggling without talking to someone. You are infinitely valuable. Um, God made you. He loves you. Um, we want this uh, conversation to be healing this evening. Well, I think you guys deserve a big round of applause. I think we can keep a lot of doors for Andrew tonight. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. I just love that. Uh, and I want you to know that your lead team, the people, your people that, that helped run this and make this happen, they were the ones that really wanted this night to happen long before I was ever your pastor. So any any credit to this planning goes to them and, and to them looking forward and realizing that this is a topic that we need to talk about in church. And uh, so I'm so excited that you're here. Again, I just wanted to point to your attention. We have connect cards found in that little basket. And in about a couple minutes, those little cards are going to open and the desk is going to come forth. And there'll be connection team members there. We want to get to know you. We want to get you plugged in. Uh, but I just want to point your attention to a couple things that are coming up here. And, and the first one is actually one of our lead team members. It's her birthday today. Nicole, would you stand up for a second? <laughs> Nicole. Nicole runs our welcome team, and she's just one of those lovely welcoming faces you see when you walk in the front door. Today's her birthday, so make sure you say happy birthday to her. Um, we have a couple more things that I want you to know about. The first one is the Christmas production on the banners right above me. Uh, is happening this weekend, and if you've been wanting to go, but you look at the price, you're like, $23, that's more than I have right now. Well, I have an offer for you. We actually need some volunteers to run and help work in Cafe Oasis for the three Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon before the show starts. If you volunteer to help out for the hour before the show starts, you get a free ticket. Is that awesome? I can tell you I was just in there practicing before tonight started, and it's going to be an amazing show. I'm sure you can hear them screeching in there, and it's so good. Um, so actually at that table right over there, actually no, ignore that, it's, we're going to put it on the, the donut when we pull it out. Uh, please consider signing up and volunteering. And the final thing I want you to know about is our sweaty formal that's happening in just a few weeks. It's $10, we want you to come, uh, dress up, wear an ugly Christmas sweater, do whatever you want, but show up, we're going to have awesome, we're going to have an awesome time, we're going to meet right before this, it's going to be fantastic. There it is. And again, I just want to, I just want to say... If money's an issue, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I really want to come for ten dollars, it's just not. Just come talk to me. Come talk to one of our lead team members. We're going to get you there. But the ten dollars just helps to cover the like fifteen hundred dollars worth of food we buy, we, like feed you with snacks and, and different stuff. So it's going to be an awesome time. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. The panelists did just mention that they're they're going to stick around for a little while up here, kind of near the front. So if you have questions that didn't get answered and you want to come talk to them, please come forward and they'd be happy to, to chat with you. Thanks so much.